I've been thinking about doing a Dratini run for a little while now. However, I've always put it off because I expect that this thing is not going to be very good. For base stats, it has 41 HP, 64 attack, 45 defense, 50 special, and 50 speed, giving it a 9.77% chance to get a critical hit in Generation 1. I nicknamed my Dratini Worm, and then I faced the rival in the lab. Now, here we get to see Dratini's starting moveset, which is Wrap and Leer. These are quite good as long as you outspeed the opponent. In this case against Eevee, there's a speed tie, so I'm going to be rolling to go first. In this case, though, I get all the luck that I need, plus the Eevee doesn't really know what to do, so I just knock it out, and with that, I am off on my adventure. Now, here on Route 1, I'm going to do some additional training, and this is specifically because I think that Brock is not going to be particularly easy to defend feet with Rotini. Once I'm level 8 over a damage running threshold, I face the rival on Route 22. This is just so I can get some extra experience. Unfortunately, I'm not faster than the Spiro, and it lowers my defense twice before I knock it out. Okay, time for the Eevee. I am faster than this Pokemon, and here I should explain how Wrap works in Generation 1. When you use it, the opponent actually can't attack until Wrap finishes, so if you're out speeding, you can trap them endlessly as long as Wrap doesn't miss. So now that I've defeated the rival there, that means that he is going to choose to evolve his Eevee into Jolteon. Granted, Dratini would only really be weak against the Vaporeon because it gets ice moves, but the only way that he's going to choose that Pokemon is if I lose in the lab. In most of my playthroughs, I don't really feel like it's fair to intentionally lose in the lab when the Pokemon has the ability to win, so that's why I very rarely face the Vaporeon team. I really only face it if the Pokemon can't win in the lab, which is like so rare. Now in Viridian Forest, I'm going to fight all of the trainers to level Dratini up as much as possible, and here I should mention what I think is this thing's biggest weakness, and that's the fact that it has a slow growth rate. In the past, even amazing Pokemon like Tauros haven't done nearly as well as you'd expect them to, just because of how slow they level up, and since Dratini is a weak first stage Pokemon, I do expect this to cause problems as the game progresses. For now, I need to spend time leveling up, and this is because of my speed stat. I'm going to need 24 to move first against all of Brock's Pokemon, and this is going to be very important if I have any hope of winning with Wrap. Okay, so now as I train up for Brock, which is going to take a little while, let's talk about Dratini's move pool. Through level up, it learns some useful moves, Thunder Wave and Agility. It gets Dragon Rage at level 40, which I think is just too late. If it started with that move, it would be incredibly useful. I think it's notable that Dratini learns Hyper Beam. This is actually the only unevolved Pokemon in Generation 1 that can learn this move. Funnily enough, though, it doesn't learn it through TM and HM, but it does get access to a lot of other really useful moves. Body Slam, Bubble Beam, Ice Beam, Blizzard, Thunderbolt, Fire Blast, and Surf. The last of these is an HM move, and there's no move deleter in Generation 1, so I doubt that I'm going to find a use for it today. At level 14, Dratini finally has enough speed to move first against Brock, so let's face him, because this early game has taken quite a while. Up first is Geodude. Now against this thing, I need to be careful about the number of leers that I use. If I use too many, then Dratini will take a lot of damage and not be able to survive the Onyx. But if I do too many, then I might not have enough Wrath PP to knock the Onyx out. I figured that setting up four would be enough today, and it looks like I'm doing about three damage with each hit from Wrath. Unfortunately, as I go, Wrath does miss, allowing Geodude to hit with one more tackle, taking Dratini down to 16 hit points before the Onyx comes out. Now there's no way that I can knock it out without setting up some leers, what I'm really hoping for here is that it uses Bide as early on as possible so that I can set up for free. Unfortunately, Onyx just keeps attacking. Eventually, once Dratini has 8 hit points, it uses Screech and then Bide, allowing me to fully set up with Leer. Okay, so let's see how much Wrap is... Uh, okay, it's... Uh, with. Okay, that's a critical hit, so it only did like 1 damage. By the way, now each one of my hits with this Wrap are going to do the same amount of damage. On the next use of Wrap, it once again gets a crit, which is really frustrating, so I'm really not doing very much to the Onyx. But when it doesn't crit, looks like I'm only doing maybe three damage or two. Rap then misses, and Onyx knocks Dratini out with Bind. 
Ah, uh, so frustrating. Okay, I think I can do better if I just use less Leers against the Geodude and take less damage as a result. In the next battle, I only set up against it twice, and then I switch into Wrap. After all, I deplete just over 20% of my PP by the time Onyx comes out with this method. Okay, now it's time to set up Leer. Hopefully this thing goes for Bide, but in this case, it just doesn't. It takes Dratini down to 7 hit points, and now it's time for me to Wrap. Again, what I'm really hoping for is that I can just endlessly trap this thing and never miss. However, Rap only has 85% accuracy, so eventually I do. Onyx hits Bind, and Dratini survives with one hit point. Okay, so Onyx is on red. I think I can do this. I select Rap, it connects, but it only hits twice, and that means I'm gonna have to choose it again. Please don't miss. And in this critical moment, Dratini doesn't, finishing Brock's Onyx off. Okay, so that was a 16 minute and 13 second split. Honestly, not bad for a weak first stage Pokemon that only had a normal type move. Defeating Brock gives Dratini a 12.5% boost to its attack stat. However, I don't think this is the most important prize. I'm actually going to put Bide on my move set. Like, it might be better than Wrap, especially if I run out of PP. Also, on Route 3, I just want to direct your attention to my PP, so uh, just look at it up in the top left. As I defeat these trainers, I'll cut out all the battles so it's convenient for you. Watch the PP. By the time I get to the final bug catcher, I wasn't sure if I should keep going. I could use Bide against the Caterpie, save some PP on Wrap, or I could just hope that I hit all four Wraps and knock out his Pokemon. The really worrying team member though is the Metapod, because it is going to increase its defense stat with Harden. Instead of using Bide on the Caterpie, I can also just lower its defense with Leer and then knock it out with a single use of Wrap. This gets me to the Metapod, and I have three PP left. However, after using two of them, the Metapod is only at orange health, and I need to be able to knock it out with two hits from Wrap. So here's how I can guarantee this, as long as Wrap doesn't miss. I can set up with Thunder Wave, Paralyzing Metapod, and then go for Leer until the Metapod misses due to paralysis. By the way, here you'll note that Metapod's defense stat isn't recalculating on the right side of the screen. This is because this specific playthrough was filmed before I filmed Victory Bell vs. File Plume. Once I got the feeling that I had lowered Metapod's defense enough, I go for Wrap, it hits, and Metapod goes down. Okay, so I made it to Mount Moon without having to backtrack to Pewter City to heal. That's really nice. Now just inside of the cave, over to the left-hand side, I can pick up TM12, which is Water Gun. This is going to be a nice upgrade to Dratini's moveset because it is a direct damage move and it utilizes my special stat. Granted, that isn't very good right now, but like, at least I can knock out Geodude and Onix in one hit. In order to get more experience with Dratini, just because it is a slow growth rate Pokemon, I'm going to defeat the Super Nerd on the first floor, and then any wild Geodude that I encounter, I'll simply one hit with Water Gun. I don't want to fight the last with two grass types, because I don't have really anything that's good against her, and I want to save Wrap for later on. I am going to fight the Youngster though, he has two Rattata and one Zubat. After that, I decided to backtrack and fight this Rocket on the basement floor. This means I can pick up an Aether. By doing that, hopefully I can prolong the time that I spend in the cave. I also fight the Hiker with three rock ground types, after all, Water Gun can one hit all of them, and then I head down to face the Super Nerd on the bottom floor. He isn't really anything to worry about, and coming out of this fight I have enough PP to save and then go into the fight against Jesse and James. So I was able to go through Mount Moon, do a lot of training, and not have to backtrack to the Pokemon Center. Now when I was doing this first playthrough, I just figured that fighting the rival would be the best choice. I think on rigorous analysis, it might have been possible to defeat Misty with a combination of Thunder Wave and Wrap. Also, Bide could be useful because her good AI is going to force her to only choose Tackle against Rotini. However, I decided on fighting the rival, so let's go into that fight. Up first is Spearow, of course, and unfortunately I am two speed slower than it. It hits Fury Attack and uh, gets a critical hit, hitting three times, taking Dratini down to about one-third health. It gets one more peck in, which does a lot because my defense was lowered, and Dratini survives with only four hit points. I unfortunately do not one-shot the sand troop, luckily it misses sand attack, but still, Rattata's next and it has quick attack so Dratini goes down. There is no way that that fight is going to go that badly on the second attempt. This time I'm able to take the Spearow out, retaining green health for the rest of the fight. Once again, Sandshrew misses with Sand Attack, and after that I am able to finish off the rival's Rattata, followed by his Eevee. Okay, so that is more like it. Now let's head out onto Nugget Bridge. Here against the last, Rotini levels up to level 20, so I'm going to teach it Agility in the place of Bide. That move is not very useful anymore. Because it's a stat raising move, it is going to be able to trigger the badge boost later on, and I want to keep it on my move set as long as possible just because of that. At the end of Route 25, I grab the Hidden Aether, and then I backtrack to face Misty.
All right, so up first is Staryu, and I have just enough speed to move first against it, so I can trap it in Wrap and knock it out. Up next is Starmie. Here I'm gonna go for Thunder Wave to cut its speed. Misty luckily uses an X Defend. I successfully paralyze the Starfish. Wrap unfortunately isn't doing very much, but it doesn't really have to. After all, even if I miss, the Starmie has a chance to be paralyzed, so Dratini is probably not gonna take any damage. And yes, that is how things play out. I knock Misty's Ace out, and Dratini takes the clean sweep. The prize that Misty gives me is Bubble Beam, and I'm going to teach it right away in the place of Water Gun. I was hoping that this move would give me one-shots against Sandy's Pidgeys so that I could avoid Sand Attack, but it's really not doing enough damage. Luckily, I outspeed these birds, so I can use Wrap to knock them out fairly consistently. On the SSN, I'm going to grab some items. First is Rest, then Body Slam, and finally the Rare Candy. Alright, so my moveset is really coming together by the time I reach the rival. I have Body Slam, Bubble Beam, Wrap, and Agility. By the way, I'm going to reorder my moves here because I think Wrap is the least useful. By using Body Slam, I knock out the first two Pokemon on the rival's team easily. Santru goes down to a single Bubble Beam, and so this fight is an easy win for Dratini. Now, let's take on Surge. He's only got one Pokemon, and uh, he isn't very good. Like, I guess a critical hit from Mega Kick could knock Dratini out. I also really want to outspeed the Raichu, so I decided to go for Agility to boost my speed stat, and then Mega Punch does almost half, so that's really not good. Okay, let's use Wrap so that I trap the Raichu and it can't attack. All right, in this case, I just miss. Raichu goes for another Mega Punch, but luckily it misses. Perfect. Wrap isn't doing very much damage, so I decide to use Body Slam instead to see how much more it'll do. Dratini survives a Thunderbolt. I take Raichu to orange. And then unfortunately, it hits another Mega Punch, which finishes me off. All right, there was a lot of misplays there. Let's try this again. I know I can do it. If I just spam Body Slam, that is probably the best play because eventually I'm going to get Paralysis, cut Raichu's speed, and move first anyways. And this is exactly what allows me to win on my second attempt. The prize for defeating Surge is Thunderbolt, and following the trend of the last two gym leaders, I am going to teach this move to Dratini right away, and that means it is time to let go of Rap. Now I got a comment on my last video mentioning how sometimes I talk about trainers like the Rapping last for too long, and I do think that's a fair criticism. I'm really working right now to try to make these videos as concise as is possible. Unfortunately against her today, there are some interesting interactions which I really want to point out. So Dratini gets paralyzed here against the first Oddish, which means the next Bellsprout is going to be able to wrap me to death. However, in Generation 1, if you use Agility, it reverts your speed to its original stat value and then multiplies it by the stage modifier. So as long as I'm able to get an Agility off here, I will be able to effectively neutralize the speed cut from Paralysis. Eventually, Bellsprout stops using Wrap and chooses Growth. This triggers a glitch, by the way, which recalculates Paralysis, cutting my speed even more, all the way down to 2. But then immediately after that, I use Agility, and it boosts my speed back up to 88, so that's perfect. I go for Body Slam after that. Unfortunately, I'm paralyzed. Bellsprout grows for Growth again, which cuts my speed down to 22, so now I am speed tied with this annoying Grass type. Unfortunately, I lose the speed tie. I get my speed cut again by Growth. Bellsprout follows it up with another Growth, cutting my speed all the way to one. Like, are you kidding me? And then my Body Slam connects and I knock the Bellsprout out. So I was attacking there just because I figured I might as well use Agility against the Oddish when there's no chance for it to use wrap. After all, this thing's only damage dealing move is absorb and I resist it. So I'm able to set up agility. By the way, you'll see here that it is using my plus four stage modifier to calculate my speed. So now that my worm is very fast, I'm able to one hit the Oddish and finish off her final bell sprout without getting wrapped. Normally in this next section of the game, there are a bunch of trainers which cause Pokemon issues, but today Dratini doesn't have issues against any of them. So I've made it to Celadon City. Because I'm a first stage Pokemon, I am going to go to the hideout and collect a bunch of items. This includes two PP ups, some TMs that I can sell for money in the department store, and finally a rare candy. Next, I sell a bunch of items, grab the TM for Ice Beam, and then I have to choose which vitamins to purchase. I almost decided to go for Carbos because speed is very important in Pokemon Yellow, but I am faster than all of Erika's Pokemon already, and I'm almost faster than Koga's team, and I'm only level 29, so let's go for Protein instead to improve Dratini's Body Slam. Next is Pokemon Tower, and in here, before I face the rival, I taught Dratini Ice Beam. This is a better move to have than Bubble Beam throughout the next section of the game. Yes, I don't have a water move for Giovanni's Rhydon, but really that thing is going to go down to one Ice Beam anyways. 
Against the rival's Fero, I don't want to use Ice Beam just in case it uses Mirror Move and reflects it back at me, so I use Thunderbolt first turn and then switch into Ice Beam on the next turn. After that, I knock the Shelter out with Thunderbolt, the Vulpix goes down to Body Slam, Ice Beam finishes off the Santru, and all that's left is the Eevee. I go for Ice Beam because there is a chance that I could freeze. It doesn't do quite half. I miss once with Body Slam because I had my accuracy lowered, but I'm able to hit on the next turn and knock the Eevee out. Alright, so let's head upstairs, and waiting for me is the Chandler with two Ghastly. Obviously, Ice Beam is the best choice here because it can freeze. However, remember that these Ghastly are absolutely terrible. It does Nightshade, dealing a lot of damage, then confuses me. I hit myself, then it uses Lick. It paralyzes Dratini. Like, ah, this is one of the worst fights. I hate this fight so much, by the way. I make it through Confusion, but no, Paralysis stops me from moving. The Ghastly hits Lick, taking Dratini all the way down to six hit points. And then Ice Beam finishes off her first team member. Okay, so I level up to level 30. I have the chance to learn slam, but there's no body in this move, so it's not really that good. I'm not going to learn it now. Next up is Ghastly. I'm paralyzed, so it moves first, hits Nightshade, and Dratini goes down. The nice thing about this Chandler is she is not consistently good. She really only beats you when she gets lucky, so I defeat her on my next attempt. After that, there are three items that I always collect in Pokemon Tower, so I grab those. It's a one elixir, then a second hidden elixir, and finally a mandatory rare candy. After I poke it all, the ghost Marowak out of existence, I head up to the top floor and face Jesse and James. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, Dratini is just slightly too slow to outspeed both the Meowth and the Arbok. So Meowth gets a screech off before I move on to the Arbok. It goes for Bite, which is a normal move in Generation 1, so it deals physical damage. I try Ice Beam, hoping that I'll freeze. It doesn't work out. Arbok hits Poison Sting, which actually does a lot for Poison Sting. I probably should have used Body Slam here, but I go for Ice Beam again. It doesn't freeze. Arbok hits another Bite and gets a critical hit. So yeah, Dratini goes down. A loss against Jesse and James never feels really good in this game. They are usually quite terrible. I have to say out of all of the fights against them, I think this one in Pokemon Tower is the most difficult. After all, the Arbok can use Glare to paralyze you, and then the Weezing knows Sludge, which is actually quite good. By the way, I'm actually really looking forward to using Weezing and Arbok later on in this year. I don't think they're going to be that good, but they will be fun. I was assuming that I would make it past the Weezing this time. Body Slam gets a critical hit, taking it down to red health, and then it uses Sludge, and because of an earlier Screech, it knocks Dratini out. So that is a second reset to Jesse and James in Pokemon Tower. Luckily for me, in the next battle, the Arbok poisons me instead of paralyzing me. I freeze it, knock it out, and now it's time for the Weezing. I go for Ice Beam on the first turn. It does about a quarter. I get hit by Smog. Since I'm out of PP, I go for Thunderbolt. Like, Weezing has a lot of defense. That's why I'm not using Body Slam against it. I take some more damage down to Red. And then, in the critical moment, ah, uh, Weezing hits Smog. And Dratini goes down for a third time. Like, are you kidding me? This is really bad. So instead of trying that fight again, let's head back to Celadon City. After all, I do have Ice Beam, which is super effective against all of the trainers in Erika's gym. I might as well defeat all of them right now with Dratini. After all, I am going to need to grind at some point in this run. Like, there's no way that Dratini gets through on minimum battles. One reason to fight these trainers now without delaying is that they all disappear once I defeat Erika, so I really don't want this experience to be lost forever. With them all defeated, Dratini is now level 32, unfortunately just under a damage rounding threshold. Anyways, even with less damage, let's take on Erika and see how it goes. Okay, up first is Tangela. I go for Ice Beam and it does half. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. I knock it out on the next turn. Didn't have my speed lowered, so I'm faster than the Weeping Bell. I hit Ice Beam and it does just under half. Weeping Bell tries Acid. Oh yeah, she has good AI, so... Her second two Pokemon are just going to spam this move over and over again, meaning they're going to be incredibly easy to knock out. As I said, the Gloom also goes for Acid. It does lower my defense, but it doesn't get another hit in, so I've earned myself the fourth badge. So now with Erica out of the way and a few more levels on my side, let's see if I can defeat Jesse and James. Meowth is up first. I'm actually still slower than this thing. Luckily, it does not lower my defense, and I'm able to knock it out in one hit, so that's perfect. Up next is Arbok. I use Ice Beam on it. It does about half and then it paralyzes me with glare. Oh, just great. However, I can just use agility to get around the speed drop from paralysis. So I do that, then I get a critical hit with Ice Beam, knocking the Arbok out, and now it's time for the Weezing. Unfortunately, paralysis prevents a turn. It hits Sludge. Okay, that didn't do that much. 
My next Ice Beam does a third. It takes me to orange health, and then I get a critical hit, knocking their ace out. So with that, I have cleared the way to Cycling Road. Now, it might be a great idea for me to do training on this route, but for now, I'm going to see if I can skip it. I pick up the rare candy, later on the PP up, and then I head into the Safari Zone, collecting some more important items, before I then dig out and head to Saffron City. Now I decided to go here because I can continue picking up important vitamins, as well as fighting the mandatory trainers that are in my way. After doing all of that, I decide that I might as well try to fight the rival, like maybe it's possible. He does lead with Sand Slash, it's not going to be very strong, after all I have Ice Beam. I get a critical hit, I'm actually getting a lot of critical hits with Ice Beam, so I knock it out in one turn. Next is Ninetales, this thing is absolutely terrible, just look at its moveset, Ember, Tail Whip, Quick Attack, and Roar. Against it I get my Defense Lord twice, which badge boosts my attack stat, and then I use Agility so that I'll outspeed both the Kadabra and the Jolteon. Next is Cloyster, I go for Thunderbolt, and oh it only does half, okay I was expecting a little bit more out of this move, because it survived and didn't get paralyzed, Cloyster strikes back with Aurora Beam. Of course, this is super effective and Dratini goes down. All right, so it's definitely time to do some training in Sylph. That's another advantage of coming here before trying a trainer like Koga. There are just so many trainers around every corner and a lot of them have really good experience yields like this guy, I call him the Hypno Sandwich. Of course, in this case, the Raticates are the buns. Since his Pokemon are evolved forms, they give good experience yields. Unfortunately, the first Raticate does so much damage with Hyper Fang. Like, oh gosh, this is really bad. Hypno next. I go for Ice Beam hoping for the freeze. Hypno fails to disable. That's uh, that's great. <laughs> My next Body Slam gets a critical hit, taking Hypno out, and I make it to the last Raticate. However, it outspeeds, goes for Hyper Fang, and Dratini goes down. Alright, this is a lot of losses to the members of Team Rocket. I do not like how things are going so far. I end up fighting a lot of trainers in here, taking Dratini all the way up from level 35 to level 40. Here, I of course get the chance to learn Dragon Rage, but no, it's not going to be useful at this point in the game. My moveset already is almost perfect, I'd say. Okay, so let's try the rival again. Without a crit, the Sand Slash is able to live the Ice Beam. It's very frustrating. Goes for Swift, dealing a decent amount of damage before I knock it out. Next is Nine Tails. Here, I think it makes sense to set up Agility at least once to ensure the outspeed later on in the battle. I finish it off, move on to the Cloister, and now fingers crossed, let's see how much Thunderbolt does. Okay, just more than half. However, maybe I will survive the Aurora Beam, and in this case, I do. I go for Thunderbolt again, finishing it off, and now it's time for the Kadabra. I outspeed, hit Body Slam, taking it out, and all that's left is Jolteon. Okay, I think I'm gonna do this. I go for Body Slam, but the Punk Rock Doggo survives. It hits Double Kick, and that's it for me. I try this fight again. I make it back to the Jolteon with 24 health. It's a little bit more than I had last time. I do half. Jolteon selects Pin Missile, which does a lot less damage. And as a result, I'm able to finish it off and move on to the Team Rocket boss, Giovanni himself. Now, I normally don't narrate this fight because it's normally just like annoying bloat. After all, Giovanni is just terrible. This is one of the main reasons I skip the Rocket hideout. Like, we could argue about if the Marowak skip is a glitch or if it's an exploit or if it's intended play. Everyone has commented different things on all of my videos, by the way. Anyways, there is no way to skip this fight, so I have to do it every time. So, he should be completely easy this time after all. I finish off the Rhyhorn with a single Ice Beam, move on to the Nidoqueen, I go for Ice Beam, it does half, and then it strikes back with Body Slam. And because I got hit by two Screeches, this does massive damage. And yeah, it takes Dratini out, so I lost to Giovanni. Okay, so let's just talk about Team Rocket as an organization for a second. This might be the organization's peak performance in any one of my videos. I lost to Team Rocket in Pokemon Tower, random Rocket Grunts are knocking me out, and then Giovanni is finishing me off. And you might think that this is going to be easy the second time I attempt it when my defense isn't lowered, but that isn't the case. I do less than half to the Nidoqueen with Ice Beam. It hits Double Kick, taking me down to 34 hit points. Then on the next turn, I go for Body Slam, which does, uh kind of pathetic damage. It does cause paralysis, but the Nidoqueen goes for Body Slam, and that takes Dratini all the way down to 5 hit points. Body Slam takes the Nidoqueen to red health, and then, because Giovanni uses a guard spec, I am able to win on the next turn. So that should have been a loss, but I just won because Giovanni's AI is terrible. With Sylph finished, I make the choice to fight Koga instead of fighting Sabrina, so let's do this.
He leads with Venonat. Now there's no way that I'm going to one-shot this thing. I don't think that setting up is a good idea. So I'll go for Ice Beam on the first turn just in case I freeze. Okay, I don't. And then he poisons me with Toxic. That's really bad. On the next turn, I go for Body Slam, hoping that I'll get the KO, but I just barely don't, which means that Toxic's counter is going to start stacking up. By the way, in Generation 1, you don't take poison damage whenever you knock the opposing Pokemon out. However, there's a problem here. I have to three-shot all of his Venonats, which means there is no way that I can win this fight with bad poison. As a result, I don't even make it to his Ice-type Ace. So it looks like it is time to do some more training with Dratini. I was very close to two hitting the first Venonat, so maybe I can defeat Koga at level 45. Because I don't want to give the Venonat any room to survive, I'm just going to use Body Slam two times in a row here. I knock it out in two hits, which is perfect. Maybe I can do the same thing to the second one. It does hit me with Psybeam actually getting a critical hit, which is a bit annoying, but I do take it out on my second turn. So that's perfect. Maybe the third Venonat. Okay, it definitely is going to be a two hit as well because I got a critical hit. So I've made it to Venomoth. Luckily, it doesn't select any of its ice type moves. It just goes for Leech Life. I hit with Ice Beam and oh, oh, that does like nothing. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is really bad. Please, Venomoth, do not use Psychic. It does and it finishes Dratini off. Oh, that even got a critical hit. So I think at this point it is fairly clear that skipping the training on Cycling Road was a bad idea with Dratini. I'm going to head back there and train up over the next damage rounding threshold to level 48. This should give me enough damage to start with Ice Beam and then use Body Slam on subsequent turns. Actually, Ice Beam crits twice in a row once again. Like, this move is getting so many crits in this playthrough. I think that's six up until this point. I managed to make it to the Venomoth, but I am poisoned. It goes for double team right away. Body Slam hits, doing just over a third. I take some poison damage. Venomoth sets up double team again. It's very frustrating. Body Slam takes it to red health and causes paralysis, which means I am going to outspeed on the next turn, and I think this should be my last turn in battle. I go for Body Slam. Despite the double teams, I hit and Venomoth goes down. All right, so with that badge, I get a boost to my speed stat, and I also have the ability now to use Surf outside of battle. So let's head to Cinnabar Island. After completing the mansion without doing any additional training, I head straight to Blaine. Now, Dratini technically resists his fire-type moves, but what I'm really worried about is the Rapidash and Arcanine's normal moves. One of the reasons that these are so strong is that the Ninetales loves to set up Tail Whip and then Confuse Ray, so I'm both dealing more damage to myself as well as taking more damage when I get hit. Unfortunately, Rapidash lowers my attack stat before I knock it out, and that means when I make it to the Arcanine, I'm just not going to be dealing very much damage. It uses Flamethrower, taking Dratini down to red health. I tried to go for Ice Beam, because I was feeling desperate and like maybe I'll get the freeze and take a quick win but in this case I don't get it and Dratini goes down. So instead of fighting Blaine again I'm gonna fight Sabrina. After all she is gonna be much more reliable than he will be and that's because I have a trick up my sleeve. So if I teach the move Swift in the place of Body Slam, then against her first team member Abra, I can set up Agility. This badge boosts my attack stat. And also whenever Abra hits Dratini with Flash, this also boosts my attack stat. The reason that I brought Swift into this fight instead of Body Slam is because it bypasses accuracy checks. So no matter how many times I get my accuracy lowered by Flash, I will still be able to hit Sabrina's Pokemon. I figured this strategy out a long time ago. I believe it was when I first did a Goldeen playthrough. Honestly, I really love it. You can use another badge boosting move like Defense Curl or Harden, or you can just spam a move like Reflect and get hit by Flash to get the badge boosts. I really like Agility as the move that you're using to boost because then it just ensures that you'll move first against all of her fast psychic types. Still, Dratini is a pretty weak first stage Pokemon and with full badge boosts, it only has 290 attack. So hopefully this is gonna be enough to knock out all of Sabrina's Pokemon. I go for Swift, it one hits the Abra. Okay, now it's time to see how the Kadabra goes. I go for Swift once again and it takes it out and then unfortunately here I level up right before the Alakazam okay so I really should have fought one additional trainer in her gym to prevent that still I'm not going to miss and I'm moving faster than it so let's see if I can win first turn Alakazam just uses recover healing all the damage I dealt then it goes for Psy Wave, which doesn't do very much damage and my following Swift gets a critical hit so yeah I've defeated Sabrina even with the mid battle level up so Blaine is the next major battle that I have to do but before that I want to finish off some trainers in his gym just to level up Dratini a little bit more. After all, once it gets to level 50, it can learn Hyper Beam, and I can put this move in the place of Swift, greatly improving my damage output. So here's my really unsatisfying strategy against Blaine. 
If I use Ice Beam right away, there is the potential to freeze the Ninetales. If I do, then I can set up with Agility, improving Hyper Beam's damage, and increasing the chance that I get a one hit. In Generation 1, if you get one, you don't have to recharge, so that's really nice. Now that I've done a little bit of damage to the Ninetales, I try Hyper Beam to see if it gets the KO at this range, but unfortunately, Blaine's lead just barely survives, he uses a Super Potion, goes for Quick Attack, and then I finish it off on the next turn. Okay, time for the Rapidash. It traps me in a critical hit Fire Spin, which is really annoying, and then it goes for takedown, knocking Dratini out. I attempted this strategy again, but Ice Beam didn't freeze either the Ninetales or the Rapidash, so it's able to take me out with takedown again. Rather than continuing at this level, I think it just makes sense to level up. At level 53, I will do much more damage with Ice Beam and Hyper Beam. Try for, I guess I like get a double beam strategy against the Ninetales, Ice Beam followed by Hyper Beam, and now I can two hit. Next is Rapidash, I go for the same strategy against it, and finish it off, surviving with green health for the Arcanine. Against it, Ice Beam doesn't freeze, but it just sets up Reflect and then tries for it again. Unfortunately, this does mean it survives my next Hyper Beam, I really shouldn't have gone for that move. However, the Arcanine is just determined to reflect things, so as a result, I'm able to take it down. In Giovanni's gym, I decided to do some extra training. By the way, this cool trainer is really easy if you have an ice move. After that, I end up fighting the guy with one Machoke, and like, he's not going to be a problem. Oh, okay, Hyper Beam doesn't one-hit it, that's annoying. It goes for low kick, doing a bit. Then it goes for low kick again, gets a critical hit, and uh, yeah, that's a reset. Well, it would be, but in this case, I actually think it's better to black out. I haven't saved recently, and I would have to do Blaine over again. Normally, I do not like having all of my HM Mules faint, because it costs more real time, and it really costs more game time. Plus, I have so much muscle memory, as soon as I lose, I just like hit the reset button and start the fight again. I'm really lucky here that I was being mindful, so after I've blacked out, I'm able to come back in and defeat the Black Belt. With that training out of the way, Dratini is level 55 over a damage rounding threshold, and now it's ready to face Giovanni. So unfortunately, Doug Trio is faster than me, but Giovanni just goes for a guard spec and I knock it out with a single Ice Beam. Next is Persian. I don't think that Hyper Beam is going to one hit, so I go for Ice Beam. It does almost half, and then after taking a critical hit Fury Swipes down to 13 hit points, I finish the cat off with Hyper Beam. Next is Nido Queen, and things are not looking very good for Dratini here. Oh, I guess I froze, so that's nice. This means that I can set up Agility three times for free, badge boosting my other stats. Maybe now Ice Beam will have enough power to knock the Nido King out in a single hit, but no, it doesn't. So it gets an Earthquake in and finishes Dratini off. Up until this point in the playthrough, I've collected 10 rare candies. I think that right now might make sense to use them, so let's see how Dratini does at level 65 against Giovanni. Unfortunately, it is one speed away from the speed tie with Doug Trio. Luckily, it just goes for Dig, does a bit of damage, and I finish it off with Ice Beam. Next is Persian. Ice Beam actually freezes it here, allowing me to set up agility, and I'm pretty sure now that I'm 10 levels higher, I will be able to one-hit both of the Nidos. Nido Queen goes down, Nido King's next, and it also falls. All that's left is Rhydon. It has 63 specials, so there's no chance that it survives. And with that, Dratini has completed the gym challenge. So with that out of the way, there are only six trainers left. First, I have to fight the rival on Route 22. However, I'm not worried about him at all. Dratini's current moveset stacks up so well against his team, so here's how it works. Ice Beam can be used to knock out his first two Pokemon. By the way, in Generation 1, the enemy trainers always send their Pokemon in the order that they're listed on the right-hand side of the screen. The only exception to this are trainers who switch their Pokemon, so they would, like, say, send in their second Pokemon, then switch to their third Pokemon, then maybe switch back to their second Pokemon. I think only Jugglers and Agatha can do that, though. Once I make it to the Ninetales, you will observe that it's moveset is absolutely terrible still. This is because it's a Firestone evolution, so these are the only moves that it learns by level up. As a result, I can set up agility for free here. After that, I take it out with Hyper Beam. Next is Cloyster. It has low special, so I'm able to take it out with a single Thunderbolt. And while I do level up, I still retain my agility boosts, allowing me to move first against the Kadabra, one shot with Hyper Beam, and then use Hyper Beam again on the following Jolteon. It also knocks it out, so that's an easy rival out of the way. Now, while I explore Victory Road, I just want to mention one thing and that's Dratini's current time. It's honestly not very good. When I first predicted the time that Dratini would get in this playthrough, I thought it was going to be around an hour and 30 minutes, and no longer than an hour and 50 minutes. So there is the small possibility that I clock in under my worst case scenario prediction, but I don't think that's going to be the case today. After all, first up in the league is Lorelei, who is an ice-type trainer.
Dugong's first, and against it I'm going to go for Thunderbolt. If it uses Rest, then I can set up Agility a little bit. It does almost half with its Aurora Beam. Luckily it doesn't lower my attack stat, and then I'm able to finish it off on the next turn. Alright, at least it's a two hit. Next is Cloister. I go for Thunderbolt, and it just barely survives. It strikes back with Ice Beam, its only ice move. However, Dratini also survives, so that's good. I'm moving on to the slow row. Might as well see what my damage range is like. All right, it looks like I'm actually going to get the two hit there. In this case, Slowbro has the chance to use either Psychic or Amnesia because of Lorelei's good AI. It selects Amnesia, so I survive and knock it out on the next turn. Okay, I made it to Jinx. I am faster than it, and I think that Hyper Beam is going to get the one shot. It does. Is there a chance that Dratini beats Lorelei on its first attempt? Thunderbolt does half to Lapras. It causes paralysis, preventing Lapras from moving. I move again with Thunderbolt and it gets the KO. So yes, Dratini did beat her on its first attempt. I can't believe that. All right, let's switch the tone to celebration now. After all, up next is the hiker. He really shouldn't be a problem. Obviously, I have Ice Beam for the two Onyxes. I go for Hyper Beam against the Hitmonchan. Okay, it actually doesn't get the KO. Luckily, the Hitmonchan does not have good AI, so it just uses Thunder Punch. <laughs> actually does it twice, and then I finally knock it out. I finish Hitmonly off in a single hit, Onyx goes down in another single hit, and then against the Machamp I get a freeze, so yeah, this fight wasn't an issue as expected. However, Agatha, who's next, is known for throwing a wrench in a lot of Pokemon's play. It's so often the case that when I get here, she gives me the first reset during the league. In this case, I'm going to have to knock her ghosts out with a combination of Thunderbolt and Ice Beam. I'm prioritizing Ice Beam here against the first Gengar, just in case I get the chance to set up agility for free because of a freeze. Unfortunately, the game isn't nice enough to give me this, so I have to knock out the Gengar and move on to the Golbat without setup. It's going to take two turns to knock it out with Thunderbolt. She switches into Haunter. As I was mentioning before, Agatha is one of the trainers that can switch. Then she uses a Super Potion on the Haunter, and then it puts me to sleep. Now, she could have gone for Dream Eater, but Haunter just uses Lick. She switches out for Golbat, and then confuses me with Supersonic, which actually leads to a defeat for Dratini because it hits itself twice. However, in the very next fight, my first Ice Beam gets the freeze against Gengar, which is perfect because now I can set up agility for free. After that, I'm doing so much more damage, guaranteeing the one hit on the Golbat. I finish off her first Gengar because switching shenanigans. Then I finish off the Haunter. I use Hyper Beam on the Arbok for the one hit. Okay, so it's all coming down to this final Gengar, but it just goes for Dream Eater. Then it uses Psychic doing very little, and I finish it off with my third hit. Okay, so time for Lance. This is going to be one of the easiest fights that Tratini has had in the entire game. It's kind of weird that the first stage Pokemon against Lance, who is like the Dragon Master. Yeah, no, Dratini is just way better. Like, I've got Thunderbolt for the Gyarados and Ice Beam for essentially everything else. Yes, the Aerodactyl is faster. I could have set up Agility, but I just spam Ice Beam against it, take some damage and finish it off. Dragonite's last. Ice Beam does four times damage. And that's it. Okay, so I've made it to the champion just under 1 hour and 44 minutes. Alright, my original worst case scenario prediction might actually be true. I think I'm feeling confident that I can clock in under an hour and 50 minutes. But the champion might have something to say about that, so let's see. Alright, as we get into this fight, I'm just going to note that animations are turned on by the game here, so watch out for some flashing lights, especially because the hyper beam animation is extremely extra. I'm able to take the Sand Slash out in a single hit from Ice Beam. Next is Alakazam. It's faster than me, so it hits with Psy Beam, doing about a third. And then I finish it off with a single Hyper Beam. Okay, it's really good that I have that range. Next is Executor. I just really don't want to get hit by a really long Hypnosis here. Okay, it does put me to sleep. How many turns am I going to stay asleep? So that's one. Okay, that's two. Okay, that's three. Come on, Dratini, wake up. That's four. And uh, Executor goes for Stomp, taking me down to ten hit points. And I stay asleep for a fifth turn, so it finishes me off. Honestly, that's really bad. I hate when this thing is the Pokemon that's knocking me out. By the way, it is never going to use Leech Seed because it knows that I'm a Dragon type. Luckily, it looks like I'm one-hitting both of his first two Pokemon consistently, so I shouldn't have any problems there. Unfortunately, though, the Executor once again puts me to sleep. I sleep for three turns four turns, and then on the fifth turn I wake up, but now I'm so bruised, and even if I take this thing out, the rest of the fight might be tricky. Okay, so I do finish it off, Cloister's next, I go for Thunderbolt, but it doesn't get the one hit, meaning that Dratini goes down to an Ice Beam. Alright, so I think there's a solution here. If I set up Agility, perhaps on the first Sand Slash, then I'm gonna one hit it, 
and the Alakazam. I was already doing that. Oh, unless I miss. So that's really frustrating. Okay, I one hit the Alakazam with Hyper Beam. And then after that, I'm going to have increased damage on Ice Beam, allowing me to two hit the Executor. But this time it gets a critical hit with Barrage. Luckily, it only hits twice. I finish it off and move on to the Cloister. I'm hoping now that the badge boost allows me to one-shot this thing. Uh, or I could just get a critical hit. That works too. Next is Ninetales. I go for Ice Beam. By the way, Fire does not resist Ice in Generation 1. I was hoping for the Freeze, but I don't get it. Then Ninetales confuses Dratini and finishes the fight. So instead of trying to set up on the Ninetales, I'll just go for Ice Beam first turn in case I get the Freeze, and then Hyper Beam hoping that I get the KO. I do, so I've made it to the Jolteon. Unfortunately, Agility doesn't allow me to get priority, so the Jolteon hits Quick Attack before I move with Hyper Beam. I cross my fingers, hoping that it'll do enough damage, and it doesn't. However, here's the thing. The Jolteon has good AI, so it's never going to use Thunder Wave or Thunder. It's stuck just using Pin Missile and Quick Attack. As a result, I'm able to finish it off on the next turn. Dratini clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 47 minutes, and 43 seconds, with 22 resets at level 69. A nice finish under my worst case prediction. This all took 6 hours and 18 minutes of game time. Alright, so let's go and beat Mewtwo just for a little bit of fun. By the way, I freeze it right away with Dratini, so this fight wasn't interesting at all. Now, with that out of the way, let's get into my second playthrough and see how much time I can shave off of the clock. So once again in the early game, I need to fight all of the trainers. This includes the rival on Route 22. I do this at level 9, but I honestly think that I could have done it at a slightly higher level just to outspeed the rival Spiro. After all, there is no rush to complete this fight. Now, I tried to plan things out so that I could be level 13 to defeat Brock, but that just doesn't work. Dratini is always speed tied with the Onyx, and I can't use Thunder Wave against it to cut its speed. So it has to be level 14 to ensure the outspeed. Now in the next section of the game, I have some major changes. So after I defeat Jesse and James in Mount Moon, my Dratini is going to be level 19. This means my speed stat is 33, which ties the rival Spiro on Nugget Bridge. It can use Growl and lower my attack stat, which I really don't want to have happen. Plus, there is an advantage if I decide to fight Misty first, which is what I'm going to do. So this fight's pretty easy. I can use Thunder Wave to cut her Pokemon's speed, and then use Wrap to knock them out fairly consistently. In this fight, I actually run out of Wrap PP before I knock the Starmie out, so I have to use Bide to finish it off, but that gets the job done. Now, defeating the Starmie levels Dratini up to level 20, where I learn Agility in the place of Bide, because I won't be needing that move anymore. Plus, Misty gives me the TM for Bubble Beam, which I can now teach in the place of Water Gun, and use this more powerful move against the rival. By the way, leveling up to level 20 gave me 34 speed, so I can go first against his Spearow. After that, the rest of the fight is pretty easy. Then, on the SSN, I pick up the TM for Body Slam, but I am not going to teach it right away, because I want to keep Rap on my moveset as long as is possible. After all, I don't really need Body Slam to defeat the rival here. Bubble Beam is good enough to defeat most of his Pokemon. So here's why I'm keeping Wrap. In Generation 1, you can paralyze Electric-type Pokemon, so I'll paralyze the Raichu, cutting its speed stat, and then use Wrap to consistently knock it out so that Surge can't get a victory this time. And then to avoid the awful situation that I had against the Wrapping Lass, I can uh, turn the tables on her and Wrap myself. This got a bit sketchy near the end of the fight because I did get poisoned, which means every time Wrap hits, I take poison damage, but I'm still able to finish her Bellsprout off and take the victory. Okay, so let's jump ahead to Celadon City. Once again, I'm going to go for 4 Protein, and then I'm also going to teach Ice Beam in the place of Bubble Beam. Now here, I was thinking that I should just fight Erica because, like, what can she really do to Dratini? Like, yes, Acid can be annoying and do some damage if it lowers my defense stat, but my offensive potential is just not quite good enough, and she actually defeats me. I'm not used to having that happen because Erica is typically not very good. I could have delayed this fight, but in the end I managed to take a victory on the second attempt. Not much time lost. One reason to do this fight a little bit earlier on is so that in Pokemon Tower, when I face Jesse and James, I will be faster than the Arbok. After all, I did all the training in Erica's gym to gain levels. Now that I have the Poke Flute, I'm going to start training, and I'm going to do a lot with Dratini. Basically, I'm fighting like all of the optional trainers in the mid to late game. This includes the trainers in the Fighting Dojo, and I actually lost against the Dojo Master. Just so you know, I don't film my entire second playthroughs just to save space on the hard drive. I only film the moments that are actually going to make it into the videos. 
also I wasn't filming when this fight happened. Yeah, anyways, that's a bit annoying. I have to fight him again because I do want this experience. Luckily, I'm able to defeat him on my second attempt. After doing all of this training, I head into Koga's gym at level 49. Once I defeat the trainers here, Dratini will be level 50, and now I'm going to teach Hyper Beam in the place of Body Slam. What this allows me to do is get better damage ranges against Koga's Venonats. The first one is a guaranteed knockout, the second one I have a 95% chance to knock out, and then I have a 58% chance to knock out the third one. Just to be safe against it, I use Ice Beam instead of Hyper Beam, and that allows me to get to the Venomoth. Now I could lose here because it sets up double team, but I get very lucky and Ice Beam followed by Hyper Beam manages to knock it out. Following that I'm going to head to Blaine, you'll notice that my level jumped up by 5. I defeated all of the swimmers on the sea and the surrounding areas to get this, as well as the trainers in Blaine's gym. I get some really bad luck here, by the way, in yellow, Blaine does not have good AI, so he is using fire moves against Rotini, which in this case causes a burn. So uh, yeah, that really messes up my plan and it causes a reset. So what the plan is, is to use Ice Beam followed by Hyper Beam on the Ninetales and the Rapidash. The Arcanine I have to play a little bit contextually against because it has Reflect. However, in this case, we get to see why I use Ice Beam on the first turn so many times when I need like two hits. Yeah, I get a freeze and I polish it off. So after all of that training, I can now backtrack to Sylph. And here I can sweep the rival's team. I have guaranteed one hits on all of his Pokemon. After that, I head to Sabrina's gym, do a little bit of additional training, taking Dratini up to level 58. And then I use 10 rare candies, taking it all the way up to level 68. This ensures that I outspeed all of her Pokemon because I can't use the Swift strategy this time because I taught Hyper Beam in the place of Body Slam. Either way, I have guaranteed one hits with Hyper Beam, so the only way I could lose that fight is if like I missed Hyper Beam and then like maybe Alakazam got a critical hit. Now because I use my rare candies after doing so much more training in the early to mid game without any backtracking, I am able to defeat Giovanni very easily because I outspeed all of his Pokemon. The rival on Route 22, of course, is easy as I explained last time. And then in Victory Road, I want to face some trainers. I face this lady, she has the Bellsprout line, and then this guy who has three water types. Kingler is going to be a fun run, by the way. People have asked me what the other high critical hit chance moves are in Generation 1, and a Crab Hammer is one of them, by the way. After defeating these trainers, Dratini is level 70. This puts me over a damage rounding threshold for Lorelei. I'm going to knock the Dugong out with two hits, then Cloyster is a guaranteed one hit, and on the Slowbro, I am going to use Mimic to steal Amnesia. Unfortunately, in this fight, I get taken down to low health, so I have to attack without full setup. I'm not able to one hit the Slowbro as a result, but I do take it out over two turns. Of course, Jinx is a one hit with Hyper Beam, and Lapras is a one hit with Thunderbolt. So now it's time for Agatha, and she is, by the way, the worst trainer for Dratini to fight in this entire playthrough. This time, theoretically, I should have an easier time against her because I have Substitute. By the way, when you have a Substitute in place in Generation 1, you cannot be confused. And if you're already confused, the damage that you deal to yourself will actually just erroneously be assigned to the opponent's Substitute, even if the opponent doesn't have a Substitute. Ah, uh, I love Generation 1. However, there is a flaw to this strategy, and that's that you can still be put to sleep when you have a substitute. As a result, I take so much damage and end up fainting. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, but five times. Yeah, I honestly cannot state how annoying this fight was. I have decent potential to cause things like freezes or paralysis with Ice Beam or Thunderbolt. Also, I can use Hyper Beam against the Arbok for massive damage, but in the end, I just got really unlucky in this fight today. However, I'm going to look on the bright side, and that's the fact that Lance is completely trivial. And after that, the champion doesn't really put up more of a fight. So in this fight, I want to reflect on one small detail. Remember when I fought those two trainers in Victory Road? Yes, this was so that Dratini could be level 73 for this fight instead of level 72. By doing that, I am over a damage rounding threshold, which I will explain here. So the game uses your current level to do calculations. And to be very simplistic about it, whenever the game divides a value, it just truncates off the decimal point. So if I was at level 72, then the calculation that it would run would have a decimal value, and it would just truncate that off. This is what I call damage rounding, and it really affects your damage ranges. So your Pokemon will have a big boost in damage when compared to the previous level, when your current level ends in 0, 3, 5, or 8. There's one viewer who is using these numbers in their YouTube username. If you need a generic number, I uh, suggest using them. They're very nice. So why does this materially impact this fight? 
Well, against Cloyster, if I'm level 72, I have a 30% chance to knock it out with Thunderbolt. But over the next damage rounding threshold, I now have a 54% chance to knock it out. In this case, I just get a critical hit so it goes down anyways. After that, I finish off the Ninetales, and all that's left is Jolteon. Remember, it can't do very much damage to me, so Dratini finishes the game. It clocks in with a final time of 1 hour 39 minutes and 4 seconds, with 8 resets at level 73. This took 6 hours and 7 minutes of game time. So unfortunately for the cute little dragon worm, I wasn't able to improve its results that much. Honestly, I think that really comes down to two things. Number one, it's a slow growth rate Pokemon that needs a lot of training in the mid game. Also, the second reason is of course that I had a terrible time against Agatha. By the way, I figured out how much time I lost facing her, and it was 4 minutes and 51 seconds. So with the final result that I was able to achieve resetting against Agatha, Dratini was the less superior snake because Ekans was actually faster. It had a time of 1 hour 38 minutes and 14 seconds. By the way, it only had 5 resets and it finished the game at level 79. Granted, it did get a game time of 6 hours and 19 minutes, so that's a bit more time than Dratini. If we subtract out all of the time that I spent fighting Agatha, then Dratini would be at the top of the F tier. Yeah, this thing is not very good. It just barely beat out Paris by about a minute of time. In that case, Dratini will only have three resets. And by the way, Paris finished the game at level 62. That thing is kind of a beast. I should replay it at some point. Its game time was 5 hours and 37 minutes, which is a lot better than Dratini's. And so here I'm going to have to make a judgment call. Where does Dratini deserve to be placed? Now, honestly, I think that Agatha could be this bad if I did playthroughs over and over and over again, but I don't think I would lose this this much time. This playthrough seemed like an outlier. So let's consider some other metrics. Paris, Diglett, and another snake, Onyx, all had faster game times than Dratini, whereas both Ekans and Cubone were slower. Now Onyx had a real-time finish of 1 hour 34 minutes and 15 seconds, and this was with 14 resets. So if Onyx got more lucky in its playthrough, it would definitely clock in faster. So today, because of all of that, I do think that Paris, Diglett, and Onyx should be ranked ahead of Dratini, and I think that Ekans should be ranked behind it. Strangely enough, this puts all of the Pokémon that look like snakes right beside each other. Anyways, we'll have to see where Arbok ends up later on in the year when I do that playthrough. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo so you're notified when I release new videos. Also, leave a comment because I really do try to read them all. If I've read your comment, I will have either responded to it or put a heart on it. I basically use hearts as a way to show you that I've interacted with it in some way, even if that's just reading it. Also, thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships. I will have another exclusive exclusive video coming for all of you very soon. I've just been giving my voice a little bit of time to rest, that's why there was some delay to finish off the starters in Pokemon Fire Red. Anyways, I promise that Blastoise is coming soon. Finally, if you've made it this far, you are incredible. I'll see you in my next video.